This Week in Pediatric Oncology, the podcast exploring hot topics and exciting advances in childhood cancer. TWIPO is produced by Solving Kids Cancer, nonprofits located in New York and London, dedicated to improving research and supporting families, because every kid deserves to grow up. Subscribe to TWIPO through your favorite podcast platform. This Week in Pediatric Oncology, the podcast about new advances for childhood cancer, Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode number 104, recorded on October 21st, 2022. I'm your co-host, Tim Kripe from Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. We're affiliated with The Ohio State University. And I'm here along with my co-host, Brenda Weigel from the University of Minnesota. Welcome, Brenda. Thank you, Tim, and welcome, everyone. Today, we have a special guest with us, Dr. Josh Schiffman. Welcome, Josh. Hi, everybody. Tim, Brenda, it's great to be here with both of you. Thanks for doing this. Uh, you are uh, you have multiple titles. You are a professor of pediatric hematology oncology, where you run a translational cancer research lab at Huntsman Cancer Institute, the University of Utah. You're also CEO and co-founder of Peel Therapeutics. We'll get into all that. But I wanted to start first with your background a little bit. I know you got your MD from Brown University and then sort of migrated across the coast to Stanford for your pediatric training and hemonc training, and then landed in between the two in Utah. You've been quite accomplished, over 175 papers, five patents. Obviously, we're going to talk about a company as well uh, and all your academic work. So can you tell us a bit, sort of, I know you you have actually a fascinating background, but uh, whatever you want to share sort of with how you got into pediatric cancer work. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Tim and Brenda, again, I, I'm delighted to be here talking to, to friends and colleagues. Uh, nothing is more important than, to me than uh, fighting childhood cancer, really solving kids' cancer. My journey actually began before med school. It began uh, over uh, 35 years ago when I was actually uh, diagnosed with a childhood cancer myself. So when I was 15 years old, uh, Tim and Brenda, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, and that really started me on this journey. I had a, a summer of R and R, rest and radiation, uh, and that led to uh, you know a cure of the cancer, which was great, but also introduced me to the world of of pediatric cancer and, and treatment. And I said, when I grow up, I want to be a pediatric cancer doctor, just like the doctors who took care of me and uh, helped other children with cancer. That's really, uh, uh, I'm sure, was a difficult time, but obviously gave you a, a strong purpose in life. And I think uh, calling it rest and radiation is probably a little bit of a euphemism. And I'm, I'm sure it was tough. But um, so tell me, um, when when you were studying, were there any particular, you know, things that happened, mentors, people that you met, uh, inspirational moments? Absolutely. So I've had many mentors, and that, that's really been one of the themes, I think, of my career is building these relationships and, and learning from others. And, you know, there's something really special you guys both know about the community in pediatric oncology and the team, and that we're all, we're all in this together. Really, the, my first uh, mentor and role model was, uh, or is, I should say, Dr. Ed Foreman. Uh, Ed um, was the one who took care of me, initially diagnosed me, um, and I maintain a relationship with him. And then when I ended up uh, in undergrad at Brown and then also at the med school, I volunteered in the clinic. So I got to actually work with the children with cancer and see Dr. Foreman interact with uh, other patients with cancer. And at the time I said, when I grow up, I wanna be just like Dr. Foreman. And so I've always taken that with me, although my career certainly has had twists and turns that were quite unexpected along the way. That foundation clearly has shaped the direction of your career. How do you feel that's shaped your kind of transition and balancing at both being a clinician and treating patients, but also how, how has that influenced your research and, and your, the direction of your research? Yeah, it's, you know, it's a great question, Brenda. And I would say having this firsthand experience of being uh, someone who's had childhood cancer, has been through it, you know, is really given me this unique perspective, which, which I value very much. And in fact, when uh, I don't see patients as much anymore because of the, the company and the research, but when I was taking care of patients and new diagnoses, I'd, I'd warn them, especially the Hodgkin lymphoma patients, that one of the side effects that we don't talk about is they, gr they may grow up to become a pediatric oncologist like, like I did. And, and really it's that, you know, it's that perspective, it's sort of that built-in 
empathy and you know you just you you experience what it's like to to go through uh, all, all of that and then we can talk about it later some of the late effects now that i'm experiencing 30 plus years after the treatment which really serves to motivate me right i think that's sort of the best uh, answer is that i'm just so motivated to make sure other kids don't have to go through what i've experienced myself in research and and drug development it's sort of balancing that cure and balancing going for the cure, but also minimizing the cost of that cure. And I think those questions are, are really uh, at the forefront of, of, of how we think about that. Is that somewhat shaping the direction of your current research? Yeah, absolutely. So we talk uh, in, in one breath, we talk about we need uh, safer drugs that work better, right? Less toxicity, better efficacy. And uh, one of the things that I'm really proud of and we'll talk about is some of the drugs that Peel is introducing hit both of those at the same time, right? So being able to uh, have better efficacy, meaning we can actually even dose less and that lower dosage is predicted to uh, translate into decreased toxicities and, and later on side effects. And you're using some of the newest technologies that have been used for the COVID vaccine with the uh, uh, lipid nanoparticles, maybe maybe we might as well just jump into some of that. You know, how are these things working? How have you come across uh, using this? What are your approaches? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. So, you know, my career, you know, I said I started out with the patients and realized when I started doing research in fellowship that, uh, you know, we can make a tremendous difference for, for many patients. Uh, through research, right, and really began focused on this idea of how do we translate the science that we're doing in the lab as pediatric oncologists and with our other uh, PhD colleagues, and how do we take that new technology and turn it into new to new medicines? Uh, the way that we actually got involved in the lipid nanoparticles is was a really fascinating story, which is you know, we had made this basic science uh, discovery working with colleagues. Uh, one of our um, colleagues, Dr. Carlo uh, Maley, who's a, a PhD and studies evolution of cancer, uh, noticed uh, really when they looked at the elephants uh, that elephants almost never get cancer. That had been known, but when he started sequencing uh, the genome, he and his postdoc or PhD student rather at the time, uh, Dr. Aaliyah Collin, who actually now ironically works at Peel Therapeutics, so it's come full circle, but they discovered, and then this was 10 plus years ago, that elephants have extra copies of the P53 gene, but they weren't sure if that was the reason elephants don't get cancer. And when I heard that, you know, I approached him and I let him know, look, we're taking care of patients with leaf raumani syndrome, a genetic uh, risk uh, for cancer, an inherited cancer predisposition, who are missing P53, and always get cancer. And here he was talking about elephants with extra P53, but almost never get cancer, but didn't know if that's the way it worked. So we collaborated together. We, we worked with uh, zoos, uh, which is really exciting. We even worked with Ringling Brothers and Barnum Bailey Circus with their elephants. We did the basic science work. We compared the blood of elephants to the blood of our patients. So blood with extra elephant P53, human patients missing P53, and figured out that this elephant P53 was, was actually doing a tremendous job, working even better potentially than human P53 at triggering cell death. So what does that have to do, Tim, with nanoparticles, with your questions? Well, I was at a conference actually in Israel. It was my first time visiting Israel, and this was uh, about 10, 10 years ago. And I was discussing the elephants. Now, at the time, I didn't know much about nanoparticles. And I also didn't know that my co-founder was sitting in the audience, Dr. Avi Schroeder. Now, Avi trains at uh, MIT with uh, Bob Langer, who's very much into nanoparticles and nanotechnology. Uh, and he was at Technion. He's still there, associate professor at Technion. Uh, and Technion, for those uh, listening to the podcast who don't know, Technion is like the MIT of Israel, although they like to joke that MIT is the Technion of the US. Either way, Avi is a brilliant chemical engineer, but I didn't know him. And so I'm sitting up there and, and Avi, you know, Avi does in his research, nanoparticle delivery. He can take a protein, a peptide, a gene, and pretty much deliver it anywhere in the body. So I'm talking about these amazing elephants, Tim and Brenda, and I'm saying, listen, if there was only a way, there's only a way to take from the elephants, right? 
and deliver to human patients. How amazing would that be for treating and preventing cancer? But, oh, well, that's science fiction. You can't take from an elephant and give to a person. So Avi, who I didn't know, writes down on his piece of paper, and I've told him, save this paper, Avi. He writes down, need to meet Dr. Schiffman to learn more about the elephant cancer fighting P53 to put into our nanoparticles. And then he speaks. Now, I've never met him. And I'm blown away. He's saying we can do any, deliver anything anywhere with our nanotechnology. I write on my piece of paper, need to meet Dr. Schroeder to learn more about his nanoparticles to put our elephant cancer fighting P53 inside. So we start talking during the break and we really, we, we hit it off instantly. We have an amazing connection. And we said, you know, we're both in academics, but patients are dying today, right? We don't have time to waste, time to spare. If we start a biotech company, we can move a little bit faster, maybe even a lot faster, raise the funding we need to try to get our medicines into patients as quickly as possible. So I said, Avi, what's the Hebrew word for elephant? And he said, oh, Josh, the Hebrew word is peel, P-E-E-L. So what do you think about Peel Therapeutics as a name? He said, I love it. And Peel was born. And that was, uh, you know, gosh, about seven, ten, seven to ten years ago uh, now. So uh, actually, it was seven, seven years ago. So what's happened since then is we've worked with Avi. We've worked with others, uh, other companies uh, uh, that have been uh, familiar with nanoparticles, nanotechnology. And now we're building this drug that we talked about delivering elephant cancer-fighting proteins, elephant P53 gene to uh, human patients. That's, that's the goal. And so right now it's still in development, but it's very exciting to see it moving forward. So that was a long answer, Tim, to your question, but that's how we got involved in the world of nanoparticles and nanotechnology. And, and I think that's a really great segue, Josh, into that. That sounds like that was the genesis of Peel and the conceptually kind of the, the nidus around which Peel was formed. But how has Peel now evolved? Because you are doing many yeah. other things yeah. um, in addition to nanoparticles. Tell us a little bit about kind of that evolution outside of sort of the elephant P53. Yeah. So, so Brenda, I love that you use the word evolution because this is really the heart and soul of Peel Therapeutics. So we realized early on, you know what, we're on to something here. Nature has spent 50, 100 million years creating the perfect cancer fighting protein. And I don't care how smart you are as a scientist, even as smart as Avi Schroeder, right? You're never going to beat nature, right? And so what we realize is if we look around, we can see examples in, in trees and plants and uh, even newborn babies and other animals of ways that evolution has come about to fight or prevent disease. And what we, what we realized is, you know what, Peel can be the company that helps to translate that. So for too long, you know, I've seen our colleagues make amazing discoveries, mind-blowing discoveries, right? And be featured on the covers of, of Nature and Cell and Science, all the greatest magazines. And they all articles in science, especially pediatric oncology, end the same way, right? And you know what I'm going to say. They say, oh, this could have tremendous implications for the future of treating patients. But then nothing happens, right? And the reason, and I realized this early on, is because as medical doctors, as pediatric oncologists, we're not trained to make medicines. We don't know about the FDA and, uh, you know, IND, investigational new drug submissions and, and, you know, manufacturing and chemical manufacturing control, all CMC, all the things that we need to do, toxicity studies. We know how to take care of patients, but there's a gap there. So we said, hey, let's make a company, let's use Peel as a way to take from academic discoveries and translate that into medicines, cross over that so-called valley of death so that these amazing discoveries don't die on the vine. Now, how did we get involved in some of these other drugs? Well, it comes back to relationships, right? So uh, one of our colleagues, our good colleagues, we all know him, uh, Dr. Garrett Brodeur at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia actually had asked me to come out and talk about the elephants and what we were doing with Peel and making new medicines. 
And we were talking and he mentioned this amazing uh, drug that he had been working on. And this drug actually comes originally from a tree uh, called the happy tree, believe it or not, used for thousands of years in Chinese uh, traditional medicine and actually been turned into a drug, a drug we're all very familiar with called irinotecan, and maybe some of the listeners know it as well. Now, irinotecan is a great drug for solid tumors, except it has a lot of toxicity, right? It has a lot of side effects, a lot of uh, gastric diarrhea, your blood counts drop. And unfortunately, the tumors end up often developing resistance. So it works initially and then stops working. And what Dr. Brodeur had done was working, again, this same idea of nanotechnology, not a nanoparticle, but a nanocarrier, had made uh, this drug with amazing, amazing results, unbelievably amazing results in mice. And we were talking and he said, you know, I wish there was a way to turn this into a medicine for patients. And of course, we immediately both realized, hey, we've got this company, Peel Therapy. That's exactly what we're set up to do. We have our chemical engineers. We have our clinical trial specialists. We are set to do this. And so we worked with him and began to develop that as a drug. And I'm really excited to say that drug is now in phase one clinical trials. And so it's gone all the way from an idea in Dr. Brodeur's lab, all the way back thousands of years to a, you know, a leaf that they used to chew on to feel a little bit better. And now it's going into the arms of patients and we're excited to see what will happen. And th that is a tremendous uh, progress. So much work goes into getting something into, into human patients. So congratulations on that. And it's also very exciting to, to know that you're taking sort of nature's experiments, nature's evolution, what works in nature, trying to bring that to kids with cancer. What, what has the role of advocacy been and how do you engage advocacy in your company to help uh, further your mission? Yeah, Tim, also, I love this podcast. Great questions. You know exactly what, I'm not just saying that because you're a pediatric oncologist like me, but it's true. Great questions. So, so advocacy is really so important. And one of the things as the CEO and co-founder of Peel that's really essential to me is we try to involve patients as much as possible. When we have large meetings and half the company is in Israel and half is in the US, when we get together, we always try to find a patient to come and speak to us. We've even had patients on palliative care from their hospital room, uh, really at the end of their life, talk to our 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 scientists. And, you know, again, one of the things that I've found is there's there's so many silos in, in medicine and in science uh, and in, in business and trying to break down those barriers. So just everyone is on the same team and they understand what the stakes are. And I, and I can tell you, there's not a dry eye in the room after the patients tell us their story and how much they need these new medicines. And so that advocacy then gets us working really, really hard. We like to say at Peel, you know, the lights are always on when they are being shut down in the US because it's night, it's morning time in Israel and the lights flip on there. And we're always working to push these drugs to go as quickly as we can. And we do it because of the patient advocacy, because everyone in the company knows, and also in the academic lab as well. We have patients tour through all the time that, they, that everyone who's touching any type of uh, research understands the hope that they're giving to patients. And that's really the most important thing. No, that's, that's fantastic. I really like the lights are always on. I'm just curious sort of how, how big is the company, how many people and how difficult has it been to sort of raise funding to stand the company up? Yeah, so it's, it's um, been really, again, nothing I ever trained for uh, in med school, nothing could have ever prepared me for this, but we have, you know, colleagues and it's like, I keep saying it's about relationships, talking to other people who have done this uh, previously in, in other settings. Um, so we have right now about 15 people in the company, full-time employed, but then we have many consultants and advisors who are helping us, some even pediatric uh, oncologists. And um, raising money, you know, when people see the data, it really speaks for itself. When, when people understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, it has been, um, it's not easy, but it's certainly, uh, it's, it's achievable. 
right? And so we've continued to raise money and we're, we're always raising money. We've even had uh, nonprofits uh, who wanted to donate to the research, right? Uh, to the research aspect of the company to get the drugs moving. One of the challenges, as you guys know, is trying to get the drugs into children. Pediatric oncology is often overlooked for funding. Uh, and, you know, you have to make a business case that, you know, it's important to help kids. And, and so usually you first test in adults, and now some of the rules and regulations are changing, so it's easier to test in children. But we always in Peel have our eye on getting our drugs ultimately to the children who need it most. And Josh, you just touched on sort of, I think a little bit of where I wanted to go next is that really changing landscape of a lot of changing uh, regulations and things about trying to get drugs into children, particularly children's cancer. But but that landscape has been changing over the last couple of years. And, and how do you see that changing landscape with regards to, to Peel? And what do you see as maybe some of the biggest opportunities for you as, as a company, but potentially some of the biggest challenges? Sure. Well, one of the things that's been really great is this shift to including adolescents, right? So 12 through 18. So usually when you do a clinical trial, as you, as you know, uh, for adults, it's 18 and over. Many of our patients fall, you know, in that 12 to 18 range. And, you know, we always say in pediatric, kids are not little adults. That's true. That's very true. But some teenagers are quite large. And some teenagers, really, you can think about as adults in general. And so that's really allowed us to have discussions about um, lowering the age limit uh, so that we can start to get some of these teenagers onto our trials. And of course, there's a lot of incentives now to try to include, include the children. One of the biggest challenges though, Brenda, is trying to convince external funders, right? That it makes sense because there's, there's always limited dollars and to try to explain to them, yeah, listen, this is, this is important. You, you have to sort of balance it in from a strictly business perspective and others have talked about this before, that, you know, if you get a drug approved for children, of course, you know, there's 20,000 new cancer diagnoses, give or take, each year in, in the U.S. For, for children and teenagers with cancer. That's not a very large market, whereas you know, 500, 600,000 uh, adults. But the thing about cancer drug development, which we've learned, is that there are not too many drugs that are going to be unique for children that aren't going to help adults and vice versa. So if you can figure out a way to develop them both together, then everybody, everybody wins. Uh, I mean, these are also important lessons and also important to keep pushing the system so that we can accelerate things for kids as fast as possible. Uh, I, I know we're running out of time. I guess I had one more burning question is you, you seem, I think you've maintained a, an academic lab and academic presence um, at, at University of Utah there, as well as involvement of the company. How are you balancing that and, and how important is it for you to be doing both and, rather than sort of jumping all in into Peel Therapeutics, for example, 100%? Yeah, it's so, uh, Tim, it's the way I do it is not a lot of sleep. So I'm not sure I, I recommend that for, for listeners. Um, I am able to, uh, you know, what I did early on is because there is only limited time in the day. I went down to part time uh, at my academic lab at, at Huntsman Cancer Institute. Uh, and I have really strong people in the lab who are able to help guide the, guide the lab. You know, so I joke I'm a full uh, professor, but part time. So maybe I'm a part professor. It's not it's not very. It's not exactly clear. But we, the lab is still still going. Um, but Peel really does require a lot of attention, a lot of focus. And you know, as Peel continues to grow, you know that that timing may shift. Um, what's what's important to maintain really is that relationship and that connection with all of my academic colleagues peers, the conferences, because for Peel Therapeutics, it's very important to me, Tim, that we're not going to be a one and done, or we have three drugs right now, three and done. We want that, that pipeline to continue to be open. And the only way that's going to be is if 
we still have somewhat of a presence in academics if we continue to talk to our colleagues and peers. All our drugs have been licensed from academic universities, and that's all because of relationships that Peel have established with investigators in academics. So it is it is very it is very challenging to do both. And like I said, I've had to cut back on the academics in order to give my attention to Peel so that it can continue to progress and succeed. Yeah, that's great. And I think it's a, a model, I think, for future, you know, physician scientists who may want to do more translational or applied work as well and make sure they see their work reach the clinic. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank and, you. And and Josh, as, as Tim said, we're coming up on, on time here. And I'm going to ask one last question before closing and let Tim uh, and yourself have the final words, but I want to bring it full circle back to sort of what started Peel, which was the elephant P53. And, and what do you realistically see as next steps for kind of fulfilling that dream of putting that drug into people? Oh, Brenda, it's going to happen. It's absolutely, it's absolutely, this, this is our, our core mission within with Peel. Uh, our logo has an elephant trunk in it. We're named after the elephants. So we're, we're going to make it happen. And, and you know, obviously, Brenda and Tim, there's a lot of enthusiasm and hope for P53 uh, drugs, right? And there's a, there's a lot of different approaches out there. Uh, our approach is if it's missing, let's put it back and let's put it back with something that was even better uh, to begin with. It's really, it's a technical feasibility question. And this is why we have our scientists. This is why we have our uh, partners that we're working with. And it really comes down to, again, I've said this multiple times, that relationships, right? So working with the right people, with the right scientists, with the right um, you know, drug delivery specialists, so that we can get that uh, medicine into people, right? Can you imagine, Brenda, if we have a drug for P53? It's too important not to succeed. And that would help patients with cancer regardless of age. So uh, regard, yeah, regard, regard, phenomenally important. Yes, regard, regardless, regardless of it. Right, there's, there's probably a reason why mm -hmm. evolution chose in the elephants to focus on the P53 gene and why that contributes to their ability to resist cancer. And so, like I started out saying, we've just got to listen. We got to listen to what nature is showing us and use our science and technology to, to turn that into the medicine for the patients who need it most. And while it could uh, help regardless of age, the sooner you can get it in a person to prevent cancer, the better. So the younger, the better. Yes. The younger, the better. And I look forward to the day that we can truly attack P53. So thank you, Josh. It's, it's, <laughs> it's coming, Brenda. It's coming. We're, we're still, we're, we're, we're working hard on it. So. I appreciate that. And I Really appreciate you joining us today. And it looks like that's it for this week. I want to thank my co-host, Dr. Tim Kripe. And I especially want to thank our special guest, Dr. Josh Schiffman, for joining us today and really enlightening us on PL Therapeutics, the important work of bringing novel drugs into children. So thank you, Dr. Schiffman. Thanks, Thanks. to the team at Solving Kids Cancer a nonprofit charity dedicated to improving survival through creating novel treatment options for children. Remember, the more we learn, communicate, share ideas, and work together, the faster we'll reach the day when all childhood cancer is preventable or curable. As always, keep up the fight, and thanks for listening to This Week in Pediatric Oncology. We welcome your comments, questions, or thoughts on topics for future episodes. Just drop us a note at twibbo at solvingkidscancer.org. You can follow Dr. Kripe on Twitter at kidsompdoc. Send an email to Dr. Weigel at weige007 at umn.edu. And find all Twipo episodes at solvingkidscancer.org.